Okay, we're about to start a new chapter, chapter 7 in your textbook. It's called Chemical Formulas and Names, and this is one of the most important chapters we're going to talk about all year. You really have to pay attention and, and grab onto these concepts and be able to be really, really good at writing chemical formulas and determining the name uh, of a compound from its chemical formula. We use that time and time again this year. It's sort of like the mole concept. It's one of those basic principles of first year chemistry that you really have to sink your teeth into. So you, this might be one of those videos that you might actually come back to and watch you know when you're struggling or you maybe forgot a little tiny part of how do I write the formula for this compound or how do I name this compound. This would be a good one to come back to time and time again. So here we go. Compounds are made of two or more elements. Therefore, it's necessary to know how to combine these elements to make a compound. Chemical formulas give the ratio of atoms in each of each atom of each element, excuse me, in a compound. There are three types of compounds that we're going to learn how to name and write the formulas for in this chapter. Now, it's going to take us a few videos to do that. So don't think we're going to do it all in one 15-minute uh, segment. It's just not going to happen. It's very important that you can tell which type of compound you're asked to name or write formulas for. I want to start with ionic compounds. An ionic compound can be formed in one of four ways. One, we can have a metallic element combined with a non-metallic element. B, a metallic element, can combine with something called a negative polyatomic ion, or radical. I'll introduce you to those in a little bit. Or C, a positive polyatomic and a non-metallic element. And finally, D, we can have two uh, polyatomic ions coming together, one positive and one negative. And we're going to take care of these just one at a time. Let's do a metallic with a non-metallic element first. The first thing you need to know is how to tell if an element is metallic or non-metallic. Well, we've done that already, but we're going to show you again. Some familiar elements are obvious. Metals like gold, tin, silver, iron, etc. You folks know those are metals. And non-metals such as sulfur, carbon, and oxygen. You know that those are non-metals. But there are some unfamiliar elements like what about lanthanum, niobium, and selenium? So we need a system to identify what our metals are and what our non-metals are. Now on the periodic table, either on the back cover of your text or the very front of your manual, you will see a dark line. Well, we actually drew that dark line in that appears on the right-hand side of the table. This line separates the metals from the nonmetals. So here's that line we drew in. I can't remember how long ago we did that, but that separates our metals, which are on the left of that line, from our nonmetals, which are on the right. And you can see that there are many more metals than there are nonmetals, can't you? So if it's on this side, we're going to call it a nonmetal. If it's on this side of the line, we're going to call it a metal. And the first type of ionic bond we're talking about are one of these metals bonding with one of these nonmetals. Okay? So if we take a quick look and try to find these elements, we should be able to figure out if they're metals or nonmetals. For instance, let's find the element selenium. There it is, atomic number 34. What would you call that? Good job. I would call it a nonmetal also. What about palladium? Palladium. You guys see palladium? Do you even know the symbol for palladium? Look for PD. Does anybody see it yet? Okay. It's right there, right next to silver, atomic number 46. So we would call that a metal. Good job. Iodine. There's iodine way over there. Way on the right hand side. That's a non metal. How about dysprosium? That symbol is DY. Do you see dysprosium? It's down here. It's one of those 4F elements, isn't it? Dysprosium. Now, remember, the 4Fs and the 5Fs belong in these two boxes here. So they are metals, aren't they? How about niobium? You guys find niobium? Anybody find niobium yet? Let's see, there it is. Atomic number 41, that's another metal. And finally, arsenic. Arsenic's AS, do you see it? Right there, atomic number 33. So we're going to call that a metal, or a non metal, excuse me, using our criterion, but we also learned that that might be called a metalloid, right? Isn't it right on that staircase? But for our purposes, for right now, we're going to call it a non metal. All right, 
Now, elements that form ionic compounds have a charge. We learned why they have a charge, right? Isn't it due to the gain or loss of electrons? And when they do that, they have charges, and those opposite charges hold the ions together. Metals always form a positive charge. I'll bet I could say that 10 times, and students will forget it. But metals always form positive charges. Nonmetals, when they form ionic compounds, will always form negative charges. Now, there are a couple of different ionic compounds we're going to deal with. The first is a binary compound. A binary compound is made of two elements. And whenever we see a binary compound or a compound made of two elements, those compounds, their name, will always end in ide. Okay, they will always end in ide. So let's start with a couple simple examples. If we had uh, the compound between sodium and chlorine. Well, first of all, what's the oxidation number or charge? of the sodium ion. Now, let me go back and review just a little bit for you. Don't expect me to do this a lot because we've beat this to death in some earlier videos, but you can see sodium has 11 electrons. It's not stable. It wants to have 10, doesn't it? So it can have a noble gas configuration. So to go from 11 to 10, it needs to lose one. So when it loses one, it's positive one. Okay? And chlorine, when it forms an ion, well, chlorine has 17 electrons. That's not stable. It's going to gain one to attain a noble gas configuration, so it's negative one. So we have a sodium ion that's positive one. We usually write that as Na with a plus sign in the upper right hand corner, and a chlorine ion that's negative one. So we'll write Cl with a negative in the upper right hand corner. Now this is important. It's bold typed and I even put stars by it. When positive and negative charges are brought together, the sum, S-U-M, of the charges must be zero, since all compounds are neutral. So, if I had Na positive one and Cl negative one, how many of each of those would I need to bring together so that the sum of their charges would add up to zero? Well, of course, we need one sodium and one chlorine. And that's how we'd write the formula. If I needed more than one, I would add a subscript next to the element that I needed more than one of. But since I only need, only need one sodium and one chlorine, so that the charge adds up to zero, the formula is simply NaCl. Now, we always put the positive, positively charged ion first. So Na comes before Cl. So we don't write it as ClNa, like some of you will do. That's wrong. Okay. This is simply tradition. Now, to name the compound, remember the name must end in I because it's binary. It's only made up of two atoms. So, the name of the compound between sodium and chlorine? Well, it's sodium chloride. It's binary, so the name must end in I. Okay? All right, let's try example two. How about the compound formed between barium and iodine? Well, barium is Ba. We have to figure out its oxidation number of charge. Barium has 56 electrons. We know that's not stable. It wants to get to 54 like xenon. Have a noble gas configuration, so it loses two electrons, so it's two positive. Iodine has 53 electrons. Its noble gas configuration is attained by gaining one. So iodine is I negative. So how do I write that formula? Well, I have to bring them together in such a way so that the sum of the charge equals zero. So how about BaI2? I need two of those negatives to balance out that two positive. And since I need two of those negative ions, I put the subscript two next to the ion that I need more than one of. I only need one barium, so I don't put any numbers there. It's understood that there's one there. Now the name, once again, is pretty simple. Ba is barium, so we just write barium out. And I is iodine, but we don't end it with I-N-E. It's binary. It's only made up of two types of atoms, barium and iodine. So it becomes barium iodide. Okay? Barium iodide. 
Let's do one more before we go on to the next page. What if I wanted to have the formula between aluminum and oxygen? So aluminum is a metal. It's on the left side of that line. Oxygen is a non-metal. It's on the right side of that line. What are their oxidation numbers? So aluminum has 13 electrons. It's stable when it gets to 10. So it's going to lose 3. So it's 3 positive. By the way, Chemists like to write three positive or two positive or one positive. We like to put the positive sign second. I don't know why, it's just what we do. Okay? Oxygen has eight electrons. It wants to get to ten, so it is two negative. So, how would I write that formula between aluminum that's three positive and oxygen that's two negative? One of each won't cut it. The sum of the charge will not add up to zero. Well, what if I had two oxygens? Would that help me? Well, now I'd have four negatives against three positives. So let's add another aluminum. Hmm. Now I have six positives against four negatives. And if I add another oxygen, now I have six negatives, balancing out my six positives. So the formula would be Al2. Didn't I need two aluminiums? O3. Boom. And its name would be aluminum oxide. Good job. Aluminum oxide. You guys okay with this? The important thing is, is that you know how to find these charges on the ions, which we've learned how to do earlier and I reviewed for you today. And I want to end with number three. Maybe we'll get to number four, but number three brings up an interesting problem. And this is where kids get caught up. So please pay attention. What if I wanted the formula between iron and fluorine? Now here's the problem. Iron, if you remember, is one of those transition metals. It's right there in the middle. And to become stable, it can either lose two electrons or it can lose a total of three. So it can be plus two or plus three. That means I can end up with two formulas between iron and fluorine. Formula one, we would have iron with a two plus, And of course, my fluorine, let's check its charge out as 9 wants to get to 10, is negative 1, okay? So the formula would be FeF2, okay? That would be formula 1. Formula 2, we would take the iron with the 3 plus charge with my fluorine. And that would be FeF3. Well, how would we name these? Well, you'd like to call this one iron fluoride. Right, according to the system that I've given to you. But then wouldn't this one also be called iron fluoride? No, they can't have the same name. They're physically and chemically different from each other. So they have to have different names. So this is how we do it. Pay close attention. For ionic compounds, we name the metal that can have more than one charge. We put parentheses after that. And then the charge of that metal we write in the parentheses as Roman numerals. So I put the Roman numeral 2 here because that's iron plus 2. And then I would end with fluoride. Do you see that I still end with IDE? So the name of this compound, FEF2, would be called iron 2 fluoride. What would this one be called? Well, iron parentheses. What goes in those parentheses again? Did you listen? The charge of the metal. This time, it's the Roman numeral 3, fluoride. So that would be called iron 3 fluoride. Do you see that? We don't use prefixes here. Do not use prefixes. So you can't say iron difluoride or iron trifluoride. Stop. Do not do that. Do not use prefixes. I'm going to say that one more time. When we name ionic compounds, we do not use prefixes. We use what? Well, when the uh, metal ion can have more than one charge, we use Roman numerals. And what do the Roman numerals tell us? The charge of the metal ion. Okay, do not use prefixes.
We use Roman numerals, and that tells us the charge of the metal ion. Let's do one more, and we'll call it good on this video. CUS. Now well, let's see. Copper is one of those that can have more than one charge. It's one of those transition metals. Copper can be 1 plus, or it could be 2 plus. So we're going to have to use Roman numerals for it. So we're going to start out with copper, and we're going to leave a space for Roman numerals, and then we're just going to end with sulfide. Okay? Now, what Roman numeral do I put there? That's a great question. Do I put the Roman numeral 1 or the Roman numeral 2? Now, some that haven't been listening are going to say, oh, there's one copper there, so I'm going to put the Roman numeral 1 there. No, that's not what I said. We use Roman numerals to tell us the charge of the metal ion. I need to know the charge of copper. And that's the Roman numeral I put, it, put in there. But I don't know it. But I do know what sulfur's um, oxidation number is. Sulfur has 16 electrons. It wants to get to 18. So sulfur is 2 negative. The sum of the charge, kiddos, has to be 0. So doesn't that mean that copper has to be 2 positive? So the Roman numeral I would put in here would be 2. So that compound right there, CUS, is called copper, Roman numeral 2, sulfide. Copper 2 sulfide is how we'd say it. Okay? We're going to do a bunch more and practice a ton of these. So stay tuned, okay? Bye-bye.